Hi everybody, Dana here. Welcome back. Today I'm going to answer a question about the Hadza tribe's microbiome. So this is a group of people that live in Tanzania and they have a very different kind of microbiome than people in North America do. So let's talk about it. Hi, if you haven't been on my channel, I'm Dana Green Remedios, a triple board certified registered holistic nutritionist, and I have an interest in all things that help us to stay happier and healthier. So the microbiome is one of those things. The diversity of the types of microbes that live in our guts in particular, but actually all throughout the body and many places in the body are really going to affect our health. So they interact with you know, our immune system in a really big way and in some other, other functions that we have as well. So the Hadza tribe has been singled out as having a very different microbiome than a lot of city dwellers in North America, but even compared to people who eat a fairly healthy diet, um, less processed, a little bit more traditional. Um, for example, people living in rural areas in Europe have been compared to the Hadza, and even they do not have the same benefits of the extreme diversity that the Hadza people have. So let's think about why that is. Some of it is the lifestyle that they're living. It's not just about the food. So of course, microbes can be anywhere and everywhere. We're not just talking about bacteria, although that usually is what we focus on when we talk about probiotics and the microbiome. But our microbiome also consists of the balance of things like yeast and molds or other funguses that might be in there. There may be amoebas in some cases. There might be worms in some cases, helminths. So not helmets, but helminths. And all of these things make up the microbiome. So if you have a yeast like a candida that's gonna be in balance or working with or against the bacteria in your gut, and of course all the bacteria work with or against each other. But the healthiest microbiome overall for the best kind of immune system, best immune function, best overall health and resiliency is one with a high degree of diversity. And you can get the most diversity by being exposed to the most microbes outside of your body, not just what you put into your mouth or into your body. So in other words, you can improve the diversity of your microbiome by being outside more where there are more microbes, where there are things like molts that live in the ground or things like uh, you know, amoebas in the water or there are different types of bacteria in the air, um, in the water that you drink, that you swim in, you can even encounter things, of course, which you may have run into if you've ever picked something up accidentally while traveling or perhaps um, on vacation. So the thing is that um, most people think about fiber as being the main thing that'll feed our microbiome and our bacteria. And that's certainly true that a lot of bacteria love fiber. And one of the really key ways to increase your microbiome is to increase the fiber. So the first one would be just getting outside and exposed to more microbes, and two, getting more fiber. But where do we find fiber? Fiber's in plants. And so it's not just the fiber in those plants that's helping to increase the diversity. It's also the fact that fiber comes in plants and the plants themselves have bacteria in them too, because they are also part of nature, just like we are a part of nature. So if you pick something off of a tree, it has things in it that you don't see. Um, you know, it may have worm, if <laughs> you may have run into that if you've uh, eaten something and, and found that it actually had a worm in it, or it may have some other kind of bugs. And it's also got probiotics in it. So even just one leaf of spinach has so many, so many probiotics in it. And then in addition, the fiber that's in it is going to feed the probiotics in you. And then if there's certain types of compounds within that plant called polyphenols, which are usually the more colorful compounds that you can find in there, those are going to really um, be good to specifically feed different strains of bacteria. Oftentimes we find that food that's good for us is good for our microbes and there aren't really good and bad microbes, but if you wanna have a balance that is good, 
feeding yourself good food is usually how to do it because it's about the right balance of microbes and that's what's going to really improve your health. Even some strains that are found in healthy people in North America are not found at all in the Hadza. So one example would be that they have no bifidobacteria as far as we can tell and that seems to be a marker of really good health for people in North America is to have bifidobacteria. It's one of the first strains that colonizes our guts when we're um, you know, coming out of infancy and it is usually something that diminishes as we go into adulthood and then it tends to be something that is lowest in our senior years and oftentimes we can have better health in our senior years if we have more bifidobacteria, if we're able to maintain some more of it. So how is it that the Hadza don't need or don't have any bifidobacteria, but they're very healthy and their microbiomes are very healthy? Well, the balance that they have is going to suit their needs and their lifestyle. And there may be reasons why we've evolved to have uh, maybe 10, 20% of our microbiome be bifidobacteria where the Hadza people do not have it. Um, or you know this whole this whole um, family whole genus of bacteria they don't have so when it comes to what they do have they have a lot more of certain strains that are really good at breaking down fibers because they eat so much fiber so bifidobacteria also breaks down fiber it's good at breaking down the non-edible parts of foods uh, fibers for example and resistant starch things that we don't break down very well into short chain fatty acids. So we benefit from that in our diet, but the Hadza have other things, other strains of bacteria that do break down fibers very, very well. So Prevotella is one of these strains. We don't tend to have a lot of it, have a lot more of it, and it is a, a fiber breaker downer. That's one of the things that it does. Um, another uh, strain which may sound like something that you're familiar with is the ruminococci. So ruminococci sounds sort of like a, a rumin, ruminant which is what we call animals like sheep or cows who have either multiple stomachs or they have some other digestive apparatus that enables them to digest lots of cellulose which is generally not digestible by humans. In humans we don't have an additional stomach to do the breakdown of something like grass in many parts, like a cow does, but instead we have bacteria on board that helps us with the digestion and breakdown of cellulose because we can't do it with our digestive apparatus. So some of the um, ruminococci are found a lot in livestock animals, but in the Hadza, they are present in people in larger amounts. And this could be a sign that they are consuming more of these high cellulose foods, but it could also be that they are living with and next to and very closely with animals such as cows or other animals like that. They're outside a lot and they're hunter gatherers. So another big difference between them, their microbiome and us, our microbiome is that their immune system isn't getting the bifidobacteria that we have, but their immune system has more clostridium helping to m sort of modify the way that it works. Bacteria modify the immune system, probiotics modify the immune system because the more different strains that you have, the more information is fed to your immune system and so the better it can work. Why does this happen? Because if you imagine you eat food, it goes through your digestive system. This is essentially the main way, if you think about a baby and it goes around sticking everything in their mouth, this is the main portal for our interaction with the outside world. We are basically sealed when it comes to our hands. And if you think about the way that our feet would be if we lived more naturally, we would have very calloused feet. It would be very hard for things to get in. I know this is true because I have lived three years down in Nicaragua where many people that live in a more natural way do have very much thicker feet because they are in contact with the earth and walking with their feet on the earth a lot more. And because of that, their feet are not as porous. So the only place that we are very porous is through the digestive tract, if you think about that naturally. So this is the place that we 
are interacting with the outside external of our body world the most. And so this is where we need to decide what is us, what is not us, what is friendly, what is not friendly. And the way that we learn about that is educating by interacting with stuff. The more bacteria that we have living in our gut, the more information we receive and the better we get at determining what's us, what's not us, what is safe, what is not safe. When we use the term microbiome, we're actually not talking about all the bacteria and things that are in us. We're actually talking about their genes. And the more different types of genes that we get exposed to, the more we recognize this is our genetics, that's that, something else's genetics, and the better we are at recognizing when something is a virus or something is a problematic bacteria that we do need to mount an immune response for. We have so many more allergies than the Hadza, and in part, it's probably because of their much, much better microbial diversity. In fact, one of the things that we know is that we can improve things like allergies by going outside more, especially when we're developing our microbiome as children. Being outside more as children, living on a farm, interacting with animals, swimming in lakes, being outside, breathing the air in the forest, digging in the forest where you like bring up all the like mold spores and stuff like that. Just getting used to all these different things can really, really help. There's one particular bacteria that really has only been found in lakes. And if you're exposed to it before your age two, the likelihood of you getting eczema or eczema is very, very small. And the likelihood of you getting asthma is very, very small. But if you do not have any exposure to this before that time, the likelihood of you developing one of those things is really great. And we don't know any way around anything else that will mimic this exposure and protect us in the same way that exposure to this bacteria is able to do. So it's just a factoid. But what we know about the Hadza tribe and how it's just very, very different, their microbial diversity is very, very different, not only because they eat a wider variety of foods, but because the foods that they're eating have more bacteria in them. Not just because they do eat a lot of plant-based foods, but also because they eat a wide variety of things that they will forage, that they will hunt. And this diversity, it changes from time to time. So many people will say, oh, the Hadza, they eat a lot of tubers. And it's true that they do have, um, you know, an ability to find sweet potatoes, but it's not their first choice for food. In fact, they do like animal foods. So it's not just because they eat a lot of plants that they have this microbial diversity. They actually prefer meat, if they can get it, to eating a sweet potato, uh, as has been determined by a lot of anthropologists and citizen scientists and people like that who have actually gone to live with them for some time and spoken to them at length. They would prefer to eat honey because it's sweet and delicious. They would prefer to eat game or hunted animals over eating a tuber if they had the choice. But the thing is, they live within the defined ability of their environment to support them. So unlike us, where we can go to the store and get honey, we can go to the restaurant and get meat, they don't have the ability to always have meat and they don't have the ability to always have honey. So they're only eating these things in a a kind of a, a pulse on, pulse off, seasonal kind of way. This is important because seasonality or eating things uh, in um, a kind of a, uh, a more traditional way where you are fasting sometimes, you're exposed to some food sometimes, is definitely something that is going to be better for the microbiome. So let's talk about that. What we found is that if you eat winter vegetables in winter and you eat more summery foods in summer, as they would naturally be available in the season where you live, in the sort of climate zone where you live, you're probably gonna feed a healthier microbiome than if you eat the same way all year round. So that's number one, that seasonality piece, really, really important. They might have berries in one time of the year and they may have uh, tubers in another time of the year. They're gonna have seasonality with the animals that they have available because they have distinct dry and wet seasons. They have a very 
um, a propensity for drought. So the drought, it could mean that they go for a very long time without a lot of food. And so they're training their body to have times with no food. And then when there is a lot of food, they're, they're feasting. So feast and famine. And the thing about that is that it's not just about what we eat, but it's about the timing of it. And that does also affect our microbiomes. You might not know that if you don't eat for an extended period of time, your body will change your microbial diversity to adapt to that. So this could be because you fast and it could also be because you um, have you know, an eating disorder or something like that. And if you starve or if you fast or if you restrict your food, your body may end up growing more of a type of creature called archaea. This is not a bacteria, it's not a yeast or a, another kind of fungus. It's actually an entirely different kingdom. You may remember back to science, the archaea kingdom. So archon, which is what we call these things, they will actually slow down the transit time in the gut so that you have time to absorb more nutrients. And it does make you more prone to constipation, but it slows down your metabolic rate to some extent so that you have a chance to get by on less food. So you can see that having a seasonal period of fasting and then a seasonal period of feasting where you're changing the microbiome again is going to keep reintroducing different types of bacteria. And depending on what you need at the time, your bacteria is going to change to keep up with what you're eating, how you're living, where you're living, who you're living with, if you're living with animals, and all that kind of stuff. So a traditional lifestyle is not just one where you're eating traditional foods, um, but the thing about the traditional lifestyle is that seasonality and that diversity that comes sort of in a forced manner because of the availability of food not being, um, you know, you're not getting it at a grocery store. So another thing that is going to be different about the microbiome of the Hadza tribe because they're not shopping at the grocery store is they're not eating processed foods. Now, we eat food, I mean, they process their food to some extent, right? They may cook their food. Um, they might do some things like that to process their food. But what I mean when I talk about processing is that kind of hyper palatable food, that like super processed food, that changes it so much that it affects the way that it affects our body. So a sweet potato versus sweet potato flour or sweet potato starch is definitely not the same thing. You can see that in the changes to the jaws and the teeth of North Americans. The Hadza don't go to the orthodontist to get spacers and they don't need to have the same kind of work done to maintain their jaw structure because they're eating in a traditional way. When you don't chew food because you're not eating hard seeds, you're not eating tough meat, like everything is made softer, easier, it's in a smoothie, you're not going to use your jaw muscles. And it's not just about using your jaw structure, it's about the nutrients and the way that that affects the way your whole face develops, your whole palate develops. So they have this difference starting right in the mouth. And this might seem like it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about with the microbiome, but a typical mouth can have up to 400 different species or strains in it. And so the microbiome really does start in the mouth. So even just the way that we treat our mouth is different. And when you have really processed foods, you're going to have less microbial diversity. So it's not just about, um, it's about that processing and how that, because you don't need to have the strains, if you think about it, that break down really difficult to digest foods and fibers if you don't eat anything that's hard to digest, right? If you're eating everything that's easy for you to chew, um, you don't need things that'll like really help you to get break those things down, right? So you might not sustain bacteria that help you with that role, with that job, if you don't need them, right? So if we compare the um, Hadza tribe um, in another way to Western diet, so what we found is that um, their physical activity is of course also, uh, and what's, what's a good word for this? I guess cyclical would be the right word. 
so just like I was saying that their eating is seasonal, then also their activity is it's cyclical. So they are going to be as relaxed as they can be when it's time to relax. They're not gonna put out any extra energy if they don't have to, but then they might be involved in some low energy kind of activity where they are um, perhaps picking berries or they're tracking game. And then after many days of tracking, they may actually have to go into a very intense hunting moment where they're actually having to take down an animal and then immediately once they take down that animal if you're surrounded by other wild animals that want what you just hunted you don't want to be fighting a hyena for the thing that you just took down so if you just took down a wild pig and there's hyenas out there then you're going to process that pig right away you're not going to take your time so you're going to be physically doing all this work and in fact a lot of because the men hunt the women generally are going to be staying they're going to be less nomadic they're going to be staying with the children for the most part and the men are going to be more nomadic and out hunting their diets are going to differ the men get access to the meat first after the hunt and they're going to eat some of the things that are there and not bother to take them back because some things are too heavy too cumbersome to be worth taking back so they're going to leave it there and so some of those things they're going to eat on the spot and they're not gonna bring it back to the women. And then once they get back, the women aren't gonna know, like how much meat did they have to start with? And the women also, while they're back at camp, they're gonna be eating things that the men didn't have access to that they have stockpiled, like maybe tubers or things like that. So their diets are gonna, different, are being, gonna be different based along sex lines as well and based on naturally based on their activities because their activities differ quite a bit and their routines differ quite a bit so here in north america we tend to eat at you know the my whole family eats at the same times even though it doesn't necessarily suit me and them and them all the same way uh, we just do that because that's what our schedules dictate you know and that's we all eat the same food and I've seen a lot of the time that if, you know, a portion is served like this, it doesn't matter if you're a tiny little person or a great big person, you get the same portion, you're gonna eat all that food. Really what's happening is that in the Hadza tribe, if you are at this level in the tribe, you are going to get first access to special foods. And then if you are pregnant or you are an elder, or you are a senior or a retired hunter, you're gonna have first access to very important foods. And then if you are, you know, a very young girl, you're probably not gonna get access to those foods. So it's really important to recognize that it's not just about the seasonal diversity and it's not just about the overall access to all these different foods. It's about how there's diversity in how who eats what, when they eat it, all that kind of stuff. So the food that they're eating as well is again, not processed, but what I'm going to lean into now or emphasize is a different part of how that affects their microbiome. And that is that our food is sanitized. So obviously we have some bad outbreaks of like listeria on our romaine lettuce or we have E. coli coming from meat or things like this all the time. These are industrial problems where outbreaks happen because of our form of food production. But overall, the amount of microbes in our foods is actually much reduced. The animals that are factory farmed are given antibiotics in many cases. And even if they're not, they're very, um, you know, most of the way that we feed them, they're feeding food that isn't natural. It's highly processed, heat treated food. They're eating meal, you know, which is like ground corn or things like this. Like this are things that it's not giving the animals that we eat a very much microbial diversity and the plants that we eat are not really exposed to all of the difficulties that they would be exposed to in a natural environment. So if you eat a plant that has been exposed to very harsh conditions, it's more likely to have developed a lot of really great polyphenols. And those polyphenols, as I mentioned, 
feed a great microbial diversity. So it's the sanitation that we have that they don't have that also minimizes our gut microbiome in compared to the Hadza. And it's also the antibiotics that we consume in other ways. So we might put them on our skin and it gets absorbed because we have a boo-boo. We put it you know, on a cut and then we absorb the antibiotics through the skin or it might be um, again it's in our food or it might be just that we've been exposed to them because we're treating uh, medically you know that's what we're doing and so they have a lot less exposure to antibiotics because they're not essentially getting treated with that kind of medication very often and often it's because they're not in a place where that's readily available and the other reason is also because they're not getting sick so much um, but they don't have the same degree of hygiene as we do or they have a different way of thinking about things in that they are really every day interacting with their animals in a very close way in a way that most people in North America don't. So um, that's another difference. So I hope that um, you know all these different aspects make sense to you. Um, is there anything that you can do to have a gut microbiome that's more like the Hadza. So it can inform your dietary choices and your lifestyle choices to just know that eating a wide diversity of foods, including plants, including animals, including sometimes things that you wouldn't normally be eating, changing up what you eat on a seasonal basis, changing up what you eat based on your activity, who you are, your size, you know, and, and your location, all of this could positively influence your gut microbiome, other things that might positively influence yours and the microbiome of anyone developing would be to be around nature more. So just to be outside in nature, to swim in the ocean, to swim in lakes, to climb trees, to dig in the forest, to grow things in the garden, to have animals, uh, both, you know, all different kinds of animals and to be around those animals be close to them and uh, you know, also to um, think about the sanitation situation. So I'm not suggesting that you eat dirt, although I know that that is getting really popular in places like California, uh, but I am saying that maybe think about the chlorine that's coming in through your tap. Do you wanna be sanitizing your body on the inside out with chlorine or do you wanna maybe filter your water? Things like that. There are things that we can do to just modify the sanitation to get all the good benefits of sanitation without all of the negative consequences. So I hope that that helped and was a fun answer to how does the Hadza tribe's microbiome compare to ours? And um, yeah, I hope that you enjoyed it. Bye for now.